Today we're reading from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 2 and 14. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Great to have you here. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to that passage she just read, Hebrews chapter 12. And I just want to say welcome to any of you who are guests. Uh, my name is Shane Freeman, one of the pastors here. Just thrilled that you're with us. And great Sunday to join us. We're kicking off a new series this morning uh, that we're simply calling Different. And we're just going to spend the next four weeks talking about how as God's people, as Christ followers, we are to be different in every way. We're to be different in our purpose, in our pursuits, in our passions. As Casey just talked about, uh, we're to be different in how we raise our kids, how we do life as a family, how we engage our culture in every way. And in all things, we are to be different as God's people because in Christ, as Christ followers, we are different. And so Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, you know, last week, uh, being Easter weekend, churches all around this world were just jam-packed with people. Uh, e Easter is actually probably the most attended weekend of churches uh, all around the world. It's when we celebrate, designated time to celebrate Jesus' life, his death, his resurrection. And, you know, for years, people have thought, because there's a lot of people who show up on Easter who don't typically come to church other times of the year. And for a long time, church leaders have assumed that those who come to church on Easter are spiritual seekers. They're still seeking to, to know if they really believe and want to surrender their lives to Jesus. However, the last several years, it, that's kind of shifted because now it's believed that the majority of people who show up on Easter are actually those who profess to be Christians. Uh, they, they think of themselves or see themselves as believers. And just so you know, whether it's spiritual seekers or, or professed believers, whoever shows up on Easter, any Sunday, we are thrilled uh, because the message we preach is about Jesus. And all of us need to constantly be under gospel-centered preaching and teaching. Uh, however, and I think some of you will identify with this, uh, one thing that, that Easter always reminds me is that being a follower of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus, it's not just about dressing up and coming to church. Be it one time a year at Easter or, you know, like perfect attendance at church. Uh, in fact, did any of you grow up in a church, I did, where uh, they gave out every year the perfect attendance award? Did anybody grow up in a church like that? My church gave out a certificate, primarily to students and kids through Sunday school who never missed a Sunday. By the way, I never won that award. But here's the thing. I remember as I've grown older and, and as I've uh, come to understand the gospel even more so, man, that can be a really, that can send a dangerous message, especially to teenagers and kids. Because the message it can quickly send is that, that, that my membership or my attendance at church, that that is a, a, a valid measurement of my commitment to and maturity in Christ. But it's not. Now, if, if you receive that certificate, maybe you've got it on your wall at home. Don't go home and take it off. I'm proud of you. Good job. Um, but, but I think you would agree. Simply attending church is not the primary indicator of one's commitment to or maturity in Christ. Instead, as followers of Christ, one thing the Bible makes very clear that is the primary or one of the most important indicators that we are people of faith is not church attendance. It's life. It's our life. How do we live? What is our character? Do, do we blend in with the culture around us or do we stand out? Now, don't misunderstand me. How we live does not save us. We are saved by, by, by faith alone in Christ alone. But one of the surest evidences that we have been saved, that we have trusted Jesus, that we've been made new is our life. So, so, so take, for example, 2 Corinthians 5. 
Uh, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, all things are new. Galatians 2.20. Uh, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, see, what, what we celebrated last week with Jesus' life, death, and his resurrection, what Jesus did by, by coming and defeating sin and death, by delivering us from darkness, we've been made new when we place our faith in him. We, we've been given a new life. We've been given the Holy Spirit. Whereas before we were dead, now we're alive. Whereas before we were separated from God because of our sin, now we've been reconciled with God. Whereas before we were unholy and ungodly, now by faith in Jesus, we can be declared holy. We, as, as Christ followers, we are God's people. We're part of God's family. And as God's people, we are called to be distinctively different. And that's what's meant when the Bible talks about holiness. If you were here a few months ago, we did a series, 1 Peter, the, the, the core verse of that series, 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16. It says, but you are called to be holy in all of your conduct, just as your Father is holy. And we, we talked a lot about that. Now, I understand that in, in church circles, some who have been to church a long time, others who maybe church is new to you, uh, I understand this word holiness can conjure up a lot of different thoughts and images. Some of us, we think of holy, we think of, you know, sitting up straight, uh, wearing a, a, a shirt and tie, coat and tie, wearing a long dress, bunned hair. Uh, maybe you hear the word holy, you think of those people who think they're better than you or better than everybody else. They've got it all together. Maybe we think of holiness and we think of do's and don'ts. But none of those things actually capture the essence of what holiness really is. In Hebrew, it comes from a Hebrew word that literally means to, to cut. And so think about this, to be holy literally means to cut. You can even say to cut off, to cut something and set it aside. It's to be in a class of your own, to, to be distinct to be set apart for a specific purpose. That's what it means to be, to be holy. Uh, let me give you an analogy that is probably a little silly, but hopefully it will help make the sense in your mind. So in my closet at home, I have a designated place where I put my running clothes. I, I like to run, so I have some running clothes. So I have a designated place in my closet. Those are for my running clothes. These, these clothes are distinct from all of my other clothes. They're, they're separated, they're set apart. One, because they smell, and we can't get the stench out of them, but, but also because they're different. My, my running shorts are a little shorter than my other shorts. My running shirts are thinner than most of my other shirts. I don't preach in my running clothes. You're welcome. I don't, I don't eat dinner, go out to eat dinner in them. I don't wear them to work. They have a set, distinct purpose. They are set apart for one purpose, and that is for running. And that's the idea behind this term, holiness. It's to be set apart, to be different, to be distinct. And so when we, or when the Bible rather refers to God as holy, it's saying that God is distinct, he's different, he's above anything and everything. There's nothing that compares to God. He's in a class of his own. When it refers to us and our being holy, as First Peter 1 says, uh, signifies, when it refers to us being holy, it's saying that we have been set apart by God for a specific purpose. Meaning, as God's people, we serve a holy God, and as a holy God, His people, we are to be a holy, distinct people. Christians, by the very nature of our calling and our salvation, we are to be distinctively different. We're not to think like the world. But we're not to act like the world. We're not to talk like the rest of the world. We're not to behave like the rest of the world. We are distinct. We are set apart. We are different. That's what the Bible means when it calls us to personal holiness. And get this, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to put it on the screen for you. This is what Paul says. He says, for this is God's will for your life, your sanctification. So that's, a, that's a big word, same word for holiness. 
God's will for your life and my life as a Christ follower is our holiness, that in all of our conduct, we become more and more like Jesus. So, so he, here's what the gospel says. God has saved us from, through faith in Jesus, from sin, death, and darkness, but it goes one step further, and he's called us to a life of personal holiness. We, we forget that, don't we? In fact, I was thinking about this, you know, a lot of our messaging today as Christians and even as churches and as pastors, myself included, a lot of times our messaging is a message of rescue. And rightfully so, right? By faith in Jesus, God rescues us from sin. He rescues us from death and darkness. But it's not just a message of rescue, it's also a message of purpose. T too often as Christ followers and as pastors, we can talk and focus so much on, you know, getting people to heaven, to where they go to heaven when they die, that we forget that no, right now, right here, <clears throat> we are called to live holy, distinct, different lives. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. What does it mean? What does it look like to be, as Christ followers, distinctively different? And, and here's one of the reasons this <clears throat> series has really resonated with me and I think even our team. Uh, two years ago, Pew, Pew Research uh, found that 65% of Americans, think about that, 65% of Americans profess to be Christians. Now, here, if you go a little deeper, here's what they found. Those who profess to be Christians, they found of that 65%, there's a high percentage of those whose life, beliefs, and values and behaviors are no different from the rest of the world and those who say they don't even believe in God. And that's a shame. And so it really makes you think that, man, that those who profess to be Christians, are they really Christ followers? Do they have a different understanding of what that really means? Because again, yes, it means that God calls us out of darkness, but he calls us to live in the light and to be holy and different and distinct. We are to be distinctively different. Unfortunately, too often, those of us who profess faith in Christ, we're strikingly similar to the rest of the world. Our behaviors, the TV shows we watch, the things we talk about, how we spend our money, all of those things. And so God has called us to be different. He called his people in the Old Testament the same thing. A book of Leviticus, uh, man, I have not had the guts yet to preach through the book of Leviticus. And again, you're welcome. Man, you talk about a, a, a dynamic book, powerful book. But you know what the book of, De of Leviticus really is all about? Remember, it's, it, it's God's people. They, they've left Egypt. They're heading to Canaan, the promised land. And, and the book of Leviticus is all these, these laws and these, these, quote, rules, if you will, for God to help his people wrap their minds around how do you live holy, distinct lives before a holy God. It, it is actually in Leviticus 11.44 that Peter, 1 Peter 1, 16 says, he quotes Leviticus 11 where he says, you are to be holy for your God, your Father is holy. And, and so listen to what Leviticus 18, listen to what God told his people through Moses. It says, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Here it is, watch this. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. Remember, they just came out of Egypt. They're going to Canaan to the promised land. And God says, Moses, remind my people, they are not to be like the people from where they've come. And as they go to the promised land of Canaan, they're not to be like the people to where they're going. They're to be holy. They're to be distinct. They're to be different. And that's true for us today. As those who have been delivered from darkness, we are not to be like the world from which we were saved. But we're also not to be like the world in which we currently live. We are to be different, distinctively different. And so again, over the next four weeks, we'll talk more about that. Now, uh, this morning, Hebrews 12, I'm going to do what I very seldom ever do, and that is I'm going to preach from one verse, uh, Hebrews 12, verse 14. And even though it's a short, pithy verse, it's powerful in its message and, and hopefully in its application this morning, it will challenge all of us. <clears throat> One book that I've read that has really shaped my thinking when it comes to personal holiness and the pursuit of holiness, I've read it several times. I actually forgot I had it on my bookshelf, but I found it this past week. It's Jerry Bridges, The Pursuit of Holiness. 
Phenomenal little book, easy read, young believers, mature believers, it will challenge you. Uh, one thing I try to do every year is I try to pick an author and I say, okay, I'm going to read this year. I'm going to try to read most, if not everything they've, they've written. Uh, a couple years ago, I read a, uh, or did that with A.W. Tozer. He's a deep thinker, just warn you. But he's got a book called The Pursuit of God, which also just challenges us to think about what does it mean as Christ followers to pursue God, to, to pursue holiness. And, and the reason I want to start here this morning is because any growth in godliness or holiness, it starts with our pursuit of holiness. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I'm speaking, and hopefully you know this about me and about us as a church. Uh, again, we are saved not because we pursue holiness. We are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. But once we are saved, we are now empowered by the Spirit of God, and we are to pursue the life that God has called us to. And that's where it starts, with our pursuit. Now, seeing that we're going to be in one verse, let me just give you a little context uh, as to Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 1. Right away, the, the writer here reminds us that, that, that the Christian life is like a race. But it's not a 40-yard dash. It's, it's like a marathon. It is long. It can be hard. It requires endurance. And like any marathon, if you're going to run well, run effectively, endure, cross the finish line, man, you, you have got to be sure that you discard throw off anything and everything that might distract you. In fact, some of you know that I've run uh, quite a few marathons, and three of the marathons I've run have been in Washington, D.C. in early November. Two of those races <clears throat> at the start line, it was in the low 20s, and the wind was blowing like 20 miles per hour. And so here's a race of 25,000 people, and man, we are bundled up. We had sweatshirts on, uh, beanies, gloves. But once the race started, even though we were wearing those things, as we got into mile like two, three, four, the temperature started rising, our body temperature started rising. So we all started taking those things off as we would go. We'd take our sweatshirt off, we'd throw it on the side. Beanie, throw it off. Gloves, throw it off. Don't worry, they come pick it all up. We don't litter. So the point is, if I were to run that race and keep all those things on as the temperature got higher, that would have affected how well I ran. And that's the idea. Look at verse 1 here. That's the idea of the writer when he speaks here. He says, let us lay aside, all right, throw off, discard, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is before us. Now, the reality of this race, again, it's hard. We've talked about this last couple of weeks. Following Jesus is hard. We're going to talk next week about the cost of following Jesus. It, it, it comes with hardship. It comes with struggle. In the context of Hebrews 12, the struggle here is persecution, suffering for the cause of Christ. In fact, the writer refers to the persecution as that saying, hey, that is God's discipline. Now, I wish we had time to talk more about God's discipline and all it teaches here but let me just point out two things. Look at verse 6. First, it says that God's discipline is evidence of God's love for us. We don't always think of discipline that way, do we? Second, related to the first, is God's purpose with any and all discipline. God's purpose is our holiness. So look at verse 10. Speaking of our earthly fathers, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, disciplines us, our Heavenly Father, for our good that we might share in his holiness. Uh, let's just sit in that for a second. God uses trials, hardships, persecution, struggle to grow us in holiness. And again, in this context, he's talking about persecution. He's saying, hey, in, in this discipline of God, it's, it's evidence of his love for you. Now, why would the writer make a point to state this? Well, I think in the context, he's going, hey, you're in a race. It's like a marathon. It's hard. But remember, God loves you. Even the discipline, the pressure you're feeling, it's from God. He's working in you. He's working to make you holy. So it's kind of, I think, the writer's way of going, hey, don't lose heart. Run well. K keep your head up. It's like a coach in the locker room at halftime or a coach, if you're running a race and he's, he's halfway point going, come on, 
you've got this. You don't have far to go. Keep your head up. Look at verse 12 and 13. Again, it sounds like a coach. He says, therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. God's got you. God's sovereign over you. God is working in you. Run. And then we come to verse 14, our verse. And now there's a little effort that needs to be done on our part. Look at what it says. Strive for peace with everyone, even those who persecute you. Strive for peace with everyone. And here's the part that we're going to focus on. And strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, this word translated here, strive, some of your Bibles may translate it pursue. It's a word that means to press hard after, to to, to run hard after, to, to go after something. It's a command. It's something we're commanded to do as believers, and the verb tense here. It's, it's, an, it's something we're to continuously do. We're, we're to never stop pursuing. We're to never stop running after holiness. And again, one small pithy verse, but incredibly powerful. So let me just, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a few just observations from the text about pursuing holiness, personal holiness, and then I want to come and just give us a couple of applications. Okay, so here's the first thing, and I think this is critical for us to understand, and this comes back in verse 10, but man, be encouraged. God is working to bring about our personal holiness. Let me be clear on that. God is working to bring about your personal holiness. God is not working to bring about our personal happiness. That's American theology. That's not biblical theology. God's ultimate purpose in us is to grow us, to make us more like Jesus, that's his purpose. Now, I say this all the time, but I think it's because we need to hear it. I need to hear it. God does not just save us and then leave us and go, good luck, figure it out. That's not what God does. God saves us, and then he begins this transforming work in us. Again, we're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. And it's only by faith in Christ that any of us are declared right and holy before God. We are If you are a Christ follower, if you have trusted Jesus, you are positionally declared right in your standing with God. When God looks at you, he sees you as holy, not because you are holy in and of yourself, but because of Jesus' holiness and righteousness. So, So positionally as Christ followers, we are holy, but what God begins to do in us once we come to Christ is he begins to work that holiness out practically in our lives. He takes what's true of us positionally And now, as Christ's followers, he he begins to to work it out personally, work it through us personally. Now, God does not do that alone. We have a part to play in that. Hence why the writer here, verse 14 again, he commands us, pursue holiness. There's something that we need to do in light of what God through Jesus has already done. In fact, verse 14 reminds us by its very nature in the command that that progress in holiness, becoming more like Jesus, it doesn't happen automatically. Sometimes as parents, we wish it would, right? Our kids give their life to Jesus and we're like, they're gonna be completely different. Then you realize, woo, sanctification takes a while. It doesn't happen automatically. We're not declared holy one moment and then the next moment we are made holy in all of our conduct. It requires effort. It requires, and remember, I'm speaking to us as believers. There's no effort required to to come to faith in Christ. It's a gift of God. But once we are saved, it requires effort now to grow in our faith. It requires discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul loves sports analogies, which I love personally. But, But listen to what he says. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So he says, so, so run that you may obtain it. He says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, we an imperishable. So Paul talking about himself. He says, so I don't run aimlessly. I don't just, I'm not passive. I don't run aimlessly. I don't run, I don't box as one beating the air 
but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. That's effort. Dallas Willard said, grace is opposed to earning, it's not opposed to effort. Big difference. Man, we all want the, the prize, don't we? We just don't always want to put forth the effort. Effort. As a coach, I know some of you in here are coaches. Man, you're, every team wants to be the state champions, but just not every team is willing to work hard for it. And again, I'm not talking about our salvation. I'm talking about our sanctification, our growing in holiness. Yes, apart from the Holy Spirit who lives in us as believers, apart from the Holy Spirit, I don't care how much effort we put forth, we will never experience true, final, lasting change. But we do have a part to play. The way I always say this is, man, we need to do what we can do to allow the Spirit of God to do what only He can do. Because when we do what we can do and we allow the Spirit to do what only He can do, it's then that we begin to progress spiritually in holiness and in godliness. This is the purpose of spiritual disciplines. Think about it. Reading your Bible, spending time in prayer, attending church, getting connected into discipleship group, serving. Spiritual disciplines are those things that we can do that places us in an environment where God can do what only He can do. And so, what is it we need to do? Well, that's a sermon in itself. Let me stay in the context of Hebrews chapter 12. Go back to verse 1. This is how we started. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, in our pursuit of holiness, man, we, we need to always be discarding, doing away with those things that hinder our progress. And, and by the way, and I know he said I'm going to refer to the sin piece here in a minute, but let's acknowledge that a lot of times the things that trip us up, the things that keep us from progressing in personal holiness, honestly, a lot of times they're good, honorable things. But they just get in the way of what's best. So, so, so we got to say, you know, okay, so where do I spend my time? How do I spend my time? I mean, do I have some really good habits in my life? There's nothing wrong with the habit in and of itself, but the habit may prevent me from forming some spiritual habits. I can be busy doing a lot of really good things, even, quote, godly things, but my busyness doing even good godly things can keep me from growing in godliness. And, and so think of it this way. It, it is, and I'm not saying this is godly, but is watching Amazon Prime, is there anything wrong with that? In and of itself, no. But man, we can watch so much TV or Amazon Prime that we spend so much time doing that, it prevents us from having time to do things that actually allow us to pursue godliness. And the same is true for social media, our jobs, our hobbies. I've got hobbies that I love, but those hobbies can take the place of me spending more time focusing on holiness. So we got to ask ourselves, man, what are those things that I might need to stop doing, maybe even start doing, that will free me up to pursue holiness? And verse 1, he mentions this. We also have to say, okay, what sin do I need to address? What sin might I need to personally confess in order to grow in godliness? Look at verse 1 again. I love this picture of how he, he says, you know, throw off the, the things that weigh us down. He says, in the sin which clings so closely. Kind of has this image of sin that just, it holds on to you and it's not going to let go. We, we, we need to do away with it. Confession as a believer should be a way of life. Every day we should be confessing sin. Every day we need to be, yes, it's the Spirit of God who convicts us of sin, but it's our responsibility when the Spirit convicts us of sin to respond by obeying, owning our sin, confessing it, turning from it. That's repentance. Colossians 3, listen to how Paul refers to this. He says, put to death that which is earthly in you. Mortify it. Kill it. Paul goes on. He says, he gives some examples. Put to death that which is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. 
John Owen, famous Puritan theologian, once said, we've got to be daily killing sin or sin will be killing us. A pursuit of holiness and progressing in holiness, it doesn't just happen. It it requires effort. It requires intentionality. We've got to do what we can do so the Spirit of God can do what He is meant to do, and that is to transform us. I'll come back to that in a minute. Now look at the second half of the verse, verse 14. This is a little sobering. So strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now what does that mean? Well, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that our seeing God or being saved is dependent on our pursuit of holiness or the degree by which we do pursue holiness. Again, we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone. We are declared holy in our standing before God because of what Jesus has done, not based on what we do. However, and I need you to hear me when I say this, if we are truly saved if we are truly positionally right with God through faith in Jesus, there absolutely will be a desire to pursue holiness. There will be a desire to grow in holiness. Simply put, professing faith in Jesus isn't enough. There are a lot of people who profess faith in Jesus, but their life has never changed. I would go so far to say, and I don't know their hearts, and this is why, man, I never judge another person. But man, it it is clear from Scripture that there are those who profess faith in Jesus, but but they don't have a desire to grow. They don't have a desire to pursue holiness. They just live their life. They're like, whoo, I'm going to heaven when I die because I prayed a prayer, I walked an aisle, I was baptized, I'm good, I'm going to live my life. That's where this verse is a warning. It warns those who who say, yes, I'm I'm a believer, I've professed faith, I've been baptized, I've walked an aisle, but if there's no desire to pursue holiness, if you read verse 14, he says, strive for holiness, you're like, oh, okay, whatever. That's a warning to examine yourself, to make sure you're in the faith. And so I think what the writer is saying here is that personal holiness is evidence of our positional holiness. Again, We are not saved by how we live, but if we're saved, it will affect how we live. Personal holiness is evidence of positional holiness. Listen to how Jerry Bridges in his book puts it. He says, the only safe evidence that we are in Christ is a holy life. Therefore, everyone who professes to be a Christian should ask themselves, is there evidence of practical holiness in my life? Do I desire and strive after holiness? Do I grieve over my lack of holiness? And do I earnestly seek God's help to grow in holiness? You following me? You hear what he's saying? And so, and I'm going to be very direct with you. Man, there are some of us here this, this morning that you've made a profession of faith. But your life's never changed. And even this morning, you're going, wait a minute, I I don't have that desire. Man, I I did walk an aisle, I did pray a prayer, but I don't don't have that desire. That's God working in your heart. Come to Jesus today. Let him transform you. 2 Corinthians 5, let him make you new. For those of us who are Christ followers, man, and, and, and I'm speaking to myself when I say this, because too often I don't take seriously a pursuit of holiness. But I think, if anything, this passage should challenge us, encourage us, push us to take seriously a pursuit of holiness. So let me give you just a couple of things to think about as Christ followers. Man, how do we make pursuing holiness a way of life? Okay, so just a few things. Here's the first. If we're going to pursue holiness, it's got to be a priority. We've got to make it a priority. There are so many things that vie for our attention and our affections, even as Christ followers. And and I think we've got to be very, very careful to think that they're always bad, evil, sinful things. Again, sometimes they're good, honorable things, but they can compete for what's most important in our life. They literally can become idols in our life. And, And so let's be sure that we are pursuing, that we are 
seeking to live out what's already true of us in Christ, that we are pursuing a life of holiness. Make it a priority. Spend some time this week prayerfully going, okay, God, what do I need to stop doing? God, what might I need to start doing so that I can ensure that, that pursuing holiness is my primary pursuit? And you know what? I can't read your mind, thankfully. <laughs> so I can't tell you what that is for you. It's likely different for all of us. What, what I need to stop doing or start doing may be completely different from you. So you seek God, you ask the Lord to show you, and then be obedient to do those things. Which leads to a second thought here. And that is be sensitive and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Can we just for a minute say, thank you, God, that we are not meant to pursue holiness on our own, in our own strength. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the very Spirit of God who lives in us. He's called the helper for a reason. He helps us to become more and more like Jesus. We, we saw in verse 10, he is working himself in us to make us holy. So, so let's be sensitive to the Spirit's leading, his prompting. His convicting, if the Spirit convicts us of sin, let's confess our sin. If the Spirit shows us areas in our lives, patterns in our lives that, that need to be broken, let's allow Him to break them. If there's hard issues that need to be addressed, let, let Him address them. We need to do what we can do to allow the Spirit to do what only He can do. Again, apart from the Holy Spirit, and please hear this, apart from the Holy Spirit transforming us and making us like Jesus, we will never become like Jesus, no matter how much effort we put forth. But the way God has orchestrated it is now we have the Spirit of God in our lives, and if we're to grow in holiness, we need to be willing to grow. We need to be willing to obey. We need to be willing to confess. We need to be willing uh, to surrender. Uh, this is what I love about Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Paul talks about this partnership between us as believers in the Holy Spirit, God working in us. Listen to this. He says, work out your own salvation. Now, some people read that and go, oh, we're not to work for our salvation. No. Do you go to the gym and work out to get a body? No, you work out to grow your body, right? To grow your muscles and develop and your cardio, all those things. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, watch this. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What a great reminder. It basically, our working to pursue holiness is empowered by God's working in us. It's God's strength that empowers our effort. We're not alone. So be aware of the Spirit's presence. Be sensitive. Be obedient. And then here's a third and final thing, and this is so important, especially for the perfectionist in the room. Expect progress, not perfection. Did you hear me on that? Expect progress, not perfection. The goal is not perfection. The goal is progress. The goal is, is, is growth. Growing in holiness, personal holiness, is a lifelong pursuit. Now, here's the thing. <clears throat> there will be seasons in your pursuit of holiness, just like there are in mine, where you're going to see amazing growth. But then there's going to be seasons where you're going to see small incremental growth. There are going to be seasons you're going to be pursuing holiness, and you're going to feel like you're not growing at all. And, and so, in those seasons where you are pursuing holiness, and you just feel like God is blessing and you're growing, be thankful for that. But in those seasons where you're pursuing, but there's small incremental growth, in those seasons, don't give up, don't be discouraged, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. In fact, go back to verses one and two. Look at what he says. Let me read this again. <clears throat> let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Here's the phrase, looking to Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. 
not just because he's gone before you, but because of what he's done for you. By going to the cross, by, by dying in our place for our sin, by God raising him up three days later, seeing that Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God, you can rest, I can rest in the fact that, that, that Jesus has done what we could never do. He purchased our salvation. He made us holy. And now, in response to all that he's done, we are to pursue holiness. In response to being positionally holy, we are to strive to live out what's already true of us in Jesus. So let's take that seriously. Let's make a pursuit of holiness our primary pursuit, because when we do, when we do, we will absolutely be distinctively different. And when we are, the world will take notice and God will be glorified. And at the end of the day, us growing in holiness is not about us, it's about God. We're called to be holy because he's holy. So when we grow in holiness, guess who gets the glory? Not us. God does. Amen? Amen. Uh, Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the challenge that in light of what Jesus has done, we now are to pursue holiness. And God, thank you for your very spirit that lives in us, that empowers us even to put forth that effort. Uh, and God, even this morning, I do pray for those here, maybe who heard my words, heard your words hot, and even though they've made a profession of faith, maybe they've recognized this morning through your stirring in their soul that they've never truly surrendered to Jesus. I pray today they would. I even pray today that at the end of the service, they will find myself or one of our, our pastors and they would say, listen, I need to give my life to Jesus. God, I pray you'll move mightily in their hearts. For those of us who are Christ followers, may pursuing holiness be our primary pursuit. May we be very intentional to put off, to lay aside those things that hinder our growth. And may we with passion with gratitude, out of love and out of response for your amazing love and grace towards us, may we pursue a life of holiness, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.